We come now to your word, Lord, and we, we know your word doesn't return void, but it prospers, uh, it accomplishes that which you please, and it prospers to that which it is sent. So we, we trust, Lord, that this word will be, uh, cause us to prosper in the things of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you know, in chapter 1, it says, it's the only book of the Bible that says, those who study and read this book will, will, find, will be blessed. Uh, so that's why st the study of the book of Revelation is so uh, advantageous. A lot of people stay away from it for a number of reasons. One, they say, well, they don't understand it. Well, that, well how are you going to ever understand it if you don't read it and pray, you know, and you pray and read. And that's number one. Number, number two is... Uh, it is not in chronological order, and I have already given you uh, some a book to read. It's called the mystery, uh, uh, the mystery revealed. I think it's called. It's by John Shorey, S H O R E Y, John Shorey. And what it does is takes the the book of Revelation and it puts it in chronological order with comments. And if you want to read the book of Revelation and get some more understanding about it, pick up that book. It's, it is the book of Revelation with comments. And that will be very, very valuable to you. And you will see how the book of Revelation and J Jesus' teaching uh, uh, in the Gospels, you'll find it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Not John, but in what they call the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, it's, the references are made to the end times in uh, Matthew 24 is the, is the, uh, the most common of those comments. That means the largest, so the, the, the most volume to them. And you'll see how they relate to the book of Revelation. Uh, this study... You know, chapter one and uh, chapter one is a revelation of, of Jesus. It's a, and, it, and it's uh, it begins to unfold uh, this this book. And I've done the overview and the introduction uh, already, so we're beyond that. Now we have seven churches uh, on your chart that has seven churches on it. You will see uh, on the top left, Ephesus. There's the good and the bad. You know, that was the they left their first love. That was and that. By the way, all of these churches have three applications. Number one, they apply to the actual churches that were there at that time, the first century, right around uh, 60 to uh, right around 90 uh, turn of the century, right in there. That's when when John was writing this. Uh, so it applies to those churches. It also applies to the churches generally uh, uh, to the ages. Uh, on the back of this chart, you'll see that there are seven, there's a church age with the seven churches, each one of them being a, a period of time, all right? So it applies that way, and we're going to look at that. And also it applies generally, which is every one of these churches speaks to the church today. Right? So there's something in every one of those churches that can speak to us. And I, that's why I want you to be uh, open to this. It's speaking to the, to the church culture at this time, but it also speaks to our local assembly, and it also speaks to me personally. Every one of the churches, there's something in there that God wants to deal with. The reason we're studying this primarily is because we want to be ready when the Lord is returning. However much time that is, most people are, you know, as we look at all of the, uh, the, the events, the global events, things, the changes that are taking place, it's, it's sooner than we might think. So whether it's a year or two or five, it's coming soon and these churches prepare is preparing the church for his coming. Alright, that's the key. We're, we're preparing for his coming. We want to be ready uh, for, for that event. So uh, in each one there's, uh, in five of them there's all of them there's good, but in five of them there's something that God is dealing with. Only in two of the churches is the, not, there's no challenge. God doesn't bring any challenge. They're really doing well. Well, and that's number two. You see Smyrna. And in your chart down at the bottom, it says bad. There's nothing particularly, you know, outstanding in, in those areas. And then the final one is, uh, is Phil uh, the, the sixth church is Philadelphia. And there's, there's no uh, bad there. Now, if you see number, if you turn the page over, you see the number two is the, the Roman persecution. And the Philadelphia is the missionary movement. Those are the two uh, eras. Uh, church eras that are referred to and you can see the years. All right, So that's where, how this chart works. Pretty good one. And then you can find out location from the other two charts. All right. 
Uh, and there's a lot of other information on there, little boxes with all kind of stuff happening, but uh, we're not going to take a lot of time with that. That's for your own study. Now, uh, this church of Pergamos is a very interesting, a very interesting church. They're all interesting, but uh, you know, studying about this one is, is, uh, has been very intriguing to me. Now, the, the, the word Pergamos, now this is the, uh, you see it in the third one, this is the age of Constantine, right? In your chart, the age of Constantine. It means per, there's two words, per and gamos, which is mixture and marriage. So the word comes out to mean mixed marriage. It's, there's a mixture. And over the course of, of the history of the church, God was always concerned about mixture. When the, when the uh, Jewish people came out of the wilderness, I'm, I'm out of uh, Egypt, he warned them over and over again not to mix their marriages with the, with the pagan nations. And uh, that comes up a little bit later in this study. He said, you stay out of there because if you marry, re marry with their women, you're going to wind up serving their gods. And that happened over and over again. It happened with Solomon. Uh, and we'll see uh, with Balaam and Balak that, that comes up. So that's a problem in the church today. It's a problem generally where the, where the world system is mixing with the church. The, the world system is trying to impose its value system and attempting the church to condone or accept certain behaviors and certain principles of life, all right? Certain philosophies. Uh Two of them, you know, what we've been studying this on, on Wednesday night is the Big Bang Theory, for instance, and evolution. Now, those two things are taught all throughout the culture. That's, that's taught in our school system. And you would be surprised, the number of people, if you would talk to them, they do not believe the Bible. They do not believe in six days of creation. They believe in Big Bang and they believe in evolution, which ultimately is the foundation of humanism. That is a, that's a pagan belief system that's been imposed by the powers of darkness, which simply say there is no God, it just something came from nothing, and there is there's no moral absolutes, there's no accountability at the end, there's no judgment because we're just a higher form of animal. We just came out of evolution. Once you believe evolution, it's it's just uh, you're just a higher form of an animal. There's no culpability, there's no judgment or anything because there's no God, all right. And you cannot blend. You say, well, can I kind of be uh, blend uh, Big Bang and evolution with the Bible? No, you can't do that for any one of a number of reasons. Uh, to get some information on that, come on Wednesday and hear Ken Ham teach. Uh, you write that's in your uh, in your notes. Go online, listen to Ken Ham or Kent Hovind. K-E-N-T-H-O-V-I-N-D, Kent Hovind, just a genius of a man. You want to hear a guy who's got so much access mentally, uh, can, can go places so quickly, it's, it's cr incredible. He has a lot of debates with, uh, with atheists, and when you hear this guy teach, it's just a, he's just an incredible guy. Uh, so you can go there. Now, so the background of Smyrna, I want to go through this fairly quickly. It, it's 70 miles up the coast from... Uh, uh, from Smyrna. So we have uh, Ephesus, if you look at that map, you see Ephesus, and then there's Smyrna, and then just a little ways up, it's, it's Pergamum. And th th these are, the importance of this is there are three centers. You can see that Ephesus uh, was a commercial center, Smyrna was the political center, but Pergamum was the religious center. That's why when you get to one part, it says this was the seat of Satan, because the enemy always operates in that, in that realm of, of religion. For instance, humanism is a religion. That's what it is. When you say humanism, uh, it's a religion. Atheism is basically a belief system. It's a, it's a religion. And uh, so in the end times, well, over the many years, but certainly at the end times, we talked about it earlier, there's going to be another gospel, another Jesus, and another spirit. That's what Paul said, and that's already active in the world today. And uh, there, are, there are a number of ways that, that the enemy promotes these other belief systems, but makes, but packs Packages it, uh, you know, the sugar shell on the outside looks good, but the inside is 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 no good, and it's poison in it. Uh, the Shack, for instance, which is the book we just mentioned, that is filled with heresy, but it's being braced based by the church. I heard a guy talking, uh, I think last week, or maybe on Wednesday, and he said, "Well, rat poison uh, is very uh, it's an interesting commodity. Rat poison is 95% real food and only 5% poison." 
well, that's interesting. Why, they, why are these rats eating that poison? Well, it, for most of it, it's pretty good. It's just that 5% that'll get you. So the shack teaches universalism, which says everybody, God, Jesus died for everybody's sin. Everybody's going to heaven, regardless. Just some people want to have a relationship with Jesus. Others don't. Everybody's going to heaven. Uh, that's, you, you, know, uh, you know, we have a church in town, the uh, Universalist Church. Unitarian Universalist. That's what they believe. It's just uh, everybody's going to heaven one way or the other. doesn't matter what you believe. As long as you believe it with all your heart. So I guess if you're a witch and you believe in the devil and you serve the devil, you're still going to heaven. And it gets, you know, ludicrous. But uh, I digress. All right. So uh, this became, that city became so prominent, it became the capital of the eastern side of the Roman Empire. And uh, all of these cities were pagan cities, very pagan cities. Now, Zeus, uh, uh, Zeus was, uh, you know, a pagan god. It was the head of the gods. It would, that would be... Uh, replacing God Almighty, and in that city was a, 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 a an incredibly huge uh, altar to Zeus, and they believed that Zeus uh, was born there and somehow had influence over those that area. And when when John when John recorded these words from Jesus, he said when he said this is the seed of Satan. Well, it was a few reasons. Number one, it was filled with paganism. Uh, also, there was Caesar worship, where Caesar declared himself to be deity. So they had pagan temples, and I told you they had to come once a year, and they, they had to uh, offer up incense on the altar, and then they got a certificate that said they were their first allegiance was to uh, uh, to him, and then they you know then they were uh, uh, would not be persecuted, and. Uh, but this this altar to Zeus was incredible. I put it up on the screen. Uh, you'll see the. I mean, it was huge. They have a model of it here through their excavations. That's what they believe the thing looked like. Uh, so that was maybe where the power. It was the seat of Satan. You know, a lot of people say, "Well, the devil's bothering me." I said, "That will not bother you. He got you, little you, and that Satan is bothering you." No, I don't think so. A demon, probably a very little one. You know, a very obscure little demon is bugging you, and you can't take authority over it. But the devil's probably over in the Middle East, I'm thinking, you know, hanging out over there. So this was why it was called the, uh, the, the seed of Satan. And uh, also there's a Babylonian connection here. And uh, it's very interesting that the priesthood from Babylon, after the defeat by the Persians, they migrated, guess where? To Pergamos. That, that's where that cult went. And they had a, a, a structure there that included uh, a... Uh, a, a series of priests would, would wear robes, and it was the, the, a, an evil priesthood. Well, what happened is the uh, the the governor of Pergamos declared himself to be the head of that priesthood, and he called himself the Pontificus Maximus. And you know, everybody was declaring themselves as head of something. You know, the Caesar was a deity. Well, the governor or the king, whatever it would be in Pergamos, said, "I am the Pontificus Maximus, and I am head of all the priests." And all the priests had special hats on and garments and robes and everything and that's what began to develop well that became mixed say that became mixed with Christianity and and ultimately that the the power structures of Rome began to migrate and they round up in Rome and in Rome you had a pontificus maximus and you had a series of priests that had gowns and robes and out of that came the the Roman system the Roman pontificate uh, that system and that is still obviously very <clears throat> It's a, it's a global religious system. Uh, the, in the Bible, especially in, in, uh, in Revelation, it talks about Mystery Babylon. <clears throat> in Mystery Babylon, all of the, the pagan religions of the world originated in, uh, in Babylon itself under Nimrod, who built the Tower of Babel, and it was, uh, they had a, a very uh, well-developed pagan system there. And when they went out through all the world, they carried all those belief systems with them. So Mystery Babylon fundamentally is a, is a, a heritage or a false belief system and the enemy does his best and is very successful at getting people to believe error and when a person believes error then they are deceived and then they are in bondage and oftentimes on their way uh, to someplace else other than heaven called hell because they have a false belief system all right and uh, and that was uh, so mystery Babylon is that it's not a necessarily a place although some people believe that ultimately it will be Mecca, that that will be actually the seat again of Satan, that that city will be the, 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 the physical domain of false religion. 
under uh, Islam, and that's, uh, that's much to be said about that. We don't have, can't go too far with it. And uh, <clears throat> Revelation 17, 5 says this, And upon her forehead uh, was, the, was written the name, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abomination of the earth. Now that, that is the demonic system that moved from Babylon, it wound up in where? Pergamos. What was the, what was the goal? To mix Christianity with pagan beliefs. All right, and that's why you have a lot of the, you have some traditions in churches that are totally unbiblical and yet very uh, embraced by, uh, by religious people. Now, Constantine, very interesting about this guy because this was the era of Constantine and he was, uh, he was the son of, a, of his father, uh, the father of Constantine, was over in Rome and uh, during that time, uh, the father, don't know his name, but began to pray to this, to the God of this, uh, of, of the Christians. Whether he was a Christian or not, uh, we don't really know, but he be the story is he began to pray to the God of these Christians, and he began to prosper, and things started to go well in his life. Well, Constantine had a, uh, uh, there was an enemy at the gates, so to speak. I don't have his name, the, the, the name of it there, but, uh, and it, there was war coming. So what Constantine did, he started to pray to the God of the Christians. And lo and behold, in the sky, you know, you can work with this, there was in the sky the next day a shining cross with the inscription that said, in this sign you shall prosper. So then he goes and he, uh, uh, and he confronts this enemy and totally defeats them. At that point, Constantine becomes a Christian, and now we have a dramatic change at this moment. It's about 325 A.D., all right, about 325. And, uh, and the Christians are then uh, no longer persecuted. Diocletian's edict to destroy the Christians was lifted. He puts them in high office. But something very significant happens, and, and it has to do with mixture. Everybody say mixture. It's the mixed marriage problem, right? He said, well, look, uh, you guys have been persecuted all this time time, uh, and you've been having, you've been living in the catacombs, of course that was more in Rome, but wherever you've been hiding out, but the church has been growing, and it seems that you're go, you really got some faith and power, but look, the, the pagans, these, all these religious groups, they all have temples, they got all pagan temples all over the city, and you guys do not have a building, so I'm going to give you, from the resources of the, of the city, uh, and, and the government, Roman government, we're going to give you money to, buy, to build a building. And that's what they did. So they, they're no longer persecuted. They got to relax. They are out of hiding. No longer persecuted. And they build the buildings. And I've talked to you a number of times about this. They take up the model of the, of the basilica, the, Rome, the uh, government center. And in the, you know, there were chairs. And there was a platform. And there was a big chair on the platform. That was called the cathedra. I think it's Latin. It means the chair. And they began to build the buildings and call them not a, a cathedra, but a cathedral, which I think means ultimately the place of the chair. So the, the governor would sit in that chair and he had his, uh, his other leaders on chairs. And if you go into a lot of churches, that's the model that we still have today. We have someone in the front. We have, oftentimes they have a big chair and have little chairs next to it. That's very common. And that's the model. But the, and that's fine. You know, buildings are great. I'm glad we're in a building and we're, we're not too hot or too cold. Hopefully we're not lukewarm though, I'm telling you. But anyway, we'll thank the Lord for air conditioning and heat. And, uh, but it, it, it does something fundamentally to the, uh, to the outreach. You know, we're talking earlier about the, our outreach uh, strategy. And uh, it, it made people very comfortable. And a lot of the pagan beliefs started to enter into that system. And ultimately, again, it wound up in Rome. And that's, you know, the Roman system has built cathedrals all around the world. Matter of fact, I saw one in Milan the other day on television. The guy was, there was somebody killed over there, they, something. And the guy standing standing in front of the cathedral that's in Milan. Now, I didn't find Kathy fast enough. I said, I was in that building right there. I was in the third largest church in the world. Third largest church in the world. It's got like a hundred steeples. Forget one steeple. It, it, it's too big. It's, it, it, the thing is enormous. But, uh, and I went and visited many, many cathedrals over there because I love architecture and all of that stuff. So, but it was, uh, the problem is mixture. What we have to fight against and what will narrow down the, the scope 
scope of true believers in the end time and said we will not tolerate mixture ain't coming in no way no how whatever I don't care how popular it is matter of fact if it's popular out there it ain't going to be popular in here isn't that true it's like your kids come in you know when they want to do something they say what well, I got to do that because everybody's doing it so you just you just sealed your fate right there if everybody's doing it it's not going to be very good to do most likely so it, and here's another thing I'll warn you in this anything that becomes really popular out in the the, the religious culture you that's where the, the the red flags go up big time when something's very very popular in the in the Christian culture on the TV and movies that's where you got to really take a look at things and say we need to really look at this because that almost without fail there's going to be something fundamentally uh, flawed in that in that presentation and by the way the, on TV I just saw it they have a whole uh, a book out um, I'm sorry study uh, a study uh, uh, program on the shack and it's five sessions and it's uh, the guy says this is the best presentation of God he's ever seen so that's what's out there right just to let you know all right so anyway that's that's the story there now the letter to the to these guys starts at verse 12 and uh, we're going to get some. The angel of the church at Pergamos, that's the messenger. This is sent to the, to the bishop, to the pastor. These see, things saith he that hath the sharp two-edged sword. Now the sharp two-edged sword turns up a little bit later when he's in verse 16. He says, I'll fight them with the sword of my mouth. And that simply is this. When, uh, he's got this, when he speaks, things happen. When Jesus speaks, he created the world, right? So when he speaks, if we can speak a judgment over uh, a person or a, a speak judgment, Judgment, what, what he, that's the sharp two-edged sword that he's saying. When he speaks, things happen. And uh, that's who he's doing. He said, I, verse 13, I know thy works. Clearly, God knows about us. He, know, he knew about the church. He knew their mixture. And he's, he's saying, I know everything. I know the whole thing. But I know, the, I know the good stuff. But I also know, I know the stuff that you need to deal with here. There's some bad stuff going on. And, and that says something to us, that God sees us. God knows what what we're doing. It's not, we can't hide anything. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 says that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing the son of the soul and the spirit, and he lays everything naked and open before him with whom we have to do. So when you stand before the Lord, it's all naked and open for whom we have to do. Now, if you've, if you've been saved, uh, you, the good news is this. You've got a clean slate because the blood of Jesus washed it all away. Isn't that right? Now, the only thing that shows up is your good works. Because the sin has been washed away. So he said, I know your works and there are good things that you've done for the Lord. And the motivation of the heart is saying, I'm not doing this for my benefit. I'm doing it for the reward of the Lord. Anything that you do, even in a Christian way, say, I am doing this so I get a pat on the back and so I get admired, you lose that reward. That's gone. You get, you get nada. Everybody say nada. That's a, that's a, I don't know what language that is, but it means nothing. You get nothing for that because it's the motivation is wrong. It's for what you get out of it. But when you do it for the glory of the Lord, it's like those two guys that went in the boat, you know, the Moravians, and they say, for the, for the glory of God and for the reward of his sufferings. At the prison, I was preaching uh, last week, and at the end, I have some open question. I say, ask me a question. One of the, he said, well, if I get saved, isn't it, I was talking about self-life and being saved. He said, well, if I get saved, isn't it just for me to avoid hell? I said, well, yes, that's absolutely true. That's a, that would be one motivation. But not the first one. The first one is that because it's a reward of his suffering, Jesus gave his life and he loves you, and you're, and you're giving yourself to him first and foremost. And it's like, it's like anything. If, is, is the principle in the Bible, if you give, you receive? Given, given, it shall be given unto you. Sowing, that's true. But it's a motivation. If you give to get, it doesn't. It's, it's, it's the wrong motivation. But if you give because you love the work of God, and you say, I'm coming to give because I love the work of God, regardless if I get anything back, I'm going to give. But God says, now, because you've given with a pure heart, I can open the windows of heaven and you can be blessed. So we don't give for the blessing. We give for the love of God. But the outcome is that we are blessed. Amen? You got that? That's a very profound principle. Ever say amen to that? It's I think it's profound. I don't know where I learned that, but I learned it from somebody, probably Kathy. 
So there it is. You see down at the bottom of that page. So Revelation 19 says this, out of his, uh, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and tread of them in the winepress of the fear of the, of the wrath of Almighty God. Ephesians 6.17 talks about taking up the sword of the Spirit. So there's power in the Word of God, but when he speaks it, it is creative, and it can be in, in a, uh, 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 an expression of, of the wrath of God. Now verse 13 goes on to say, and, and, and I know your works, and where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is, and you, but you still hold fast my my name, and you've not denied the faith, <clears throat> even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr, <coughs> who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Now, like I said earlier, I think this was the real devil was, was hanging out there. Why? Because out of that place, out of Pergamum, would, would advance some of the most detrimental spiritual concepts, and they would flood the planet and lead many astray. That's why he showed up there. He said, you're, you're in the midst of that. He said, I know you're, you guys are faithful. You're holding fast to my word. And you're not denying my name. And uh, then he talks about this guy, Antipas, who was uh, his faithful martyr. Now, this guy, who, we don't know who he was. He may have been a leader there. You know, sometimes they'll grab hold of the leader, the pastor. They'll kill him. You say, if the... If the, if the if a shepherd is killed, then the sh and then the sheep will flee. Well, that's what will oftentimes go. Go go over after the leader and hope the people just just take off. That's what they did with Jesus. Uh, well, that didn't work because they just multiplied the whole thing. Because they, you know, after Jesus came back, they were all on fire for God, and, he, and the Holy Spirit inhabited them. But he said this that, <clears throat> and this is for us. In, in the time where the powers of darkness are going to flood throughout the earth and there's going to be great darkness prior to the coming of the Antichrist. Tremendous false doctrine that many will fall into and believe because they don't have a, tr a deep understanding and commitment to the Lord. So they're just kind of lukewarm people out there. They've lost their first love and they're just going to buy into the popularity of whatever. Okay? So <clears throat> he's saying this. He said, you, ha you hold fast when, of my name and, and don't deny my faith. He's, and, he, and he compliments them on that. This was no easy place to live. This was like living in, in Babylon. Thank you very much. This was like living in, you know, in the midst of darkness. The devil was there. Come on. Amen or oh me. You know, you got all this is, stuff is flying around and but the church at that time was not infiltrated to the way, to the degree that it would in, at some point in history. But he said, you know, uh, you held, you held money, and that's that's a word for us. We got to hold fast and, and and cleave to the Lord in these the difficult days that lie ahead. Uh, verse 14 of the second chapter. But I have a few things. Uh oh, everybody say this is the uh oh moment. You know, the the letter was going really good there. You know, so far, and a uh, few things. Uh, too bad it's a few. If it was one, but two, then it could be three, right? Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things, sacrifice to idol, and to commit what? Good old fornication. There it's back again. Now, without going into the whole story deeply, I'll just give you a brief overview. The Jews are coming out of Egypt. Balak is the king of Moab and he's afraid he's got he's up on the high place and they're coming out like ants he said there's millions of these people and he's afraid and he gets this guy Balaam who's a prophet but he's a say a false prophet he's a carnal prophet we don't know too much about him he said now Balak says whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse is cursed go out and curse these people so I can defeat these uh, these new people these Jews here Moses is leading them, and I needed the upper hand. So he says, go out and curse them. He said, well, I can't do anything except speak what God says. So he goes out there, and rather than cursing them, three times he goes out, tries to curse them, and guess what he does three times? He blesses them. He blesses them three times. Well, 
you know, Balak has got a big issue with this, and he's, he, he can't get the upper hand on him. But if you, we don't have time, but if you go to chapter, uh, you can look at the notes here. N Numbers 31, 16, over time, because he, here's what Balak does. He said, Balaam, if you curse him, I'm going to give you this. I'm going to put the gold and the silver and popularity. You're going to be a big shot above, um, uh, around this spiritual realm. And he says he can't do it. But you know what? It gets to him. And finally he circles back and he goes back to, to, uh, to Balak and he says, I can't curse him, but I'll tell you how you can get God to curse him. He said, you bring your pretty ladies over there and you just dance them along the border a little bit and wink at them a little bit. And the guys are so weak, they fall for anything. You got a pretty girl out there, they're gone. They're just in a minute. They're over the line. They think the grass is greener on the other side. So guess what? They do it. And they, and they begin to take up with the, the women of, uh, of Moab, these, <clears throat> this, these, these pagan women. <clears throat> so Numbers 31, 16, it says, Balaam counseled the children of Israel to do what? Commit trespass against the Lord. <clears throat> and the two areas are found here. They, they committed fornication, but they also sacrificed, went to their sacrificial feast. Now, uh, And you see there, it says, to cast a stumbling block, to eat things sacrificed to idols. So that just means they were doing a sacrificial system on the high places, and they were eating at the table because they married the girls, or they were dating them, and they were fornicating. And let me tell you something. you got to be really careful where you go and who you hang around with. Now, this, is, this message is going out to more than we have here. But uh, here's how the enemy has been operating in this false doctrine, saying, well, we, you know, we're all under grace, so therefore, the sin that you are committing Admitting, you know, you don't even really need to be concerned about that because of grace and God's grace. Uh, and of course, in uh, 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 chapter 6 of Romans, it says, Should we sin that grace abound? And, and, and Paul says, Big no, he said, God forbid. They said, yeah, you're going to just go and do these sins and that God's grace is going to keep covering your sin. He said, God forbid. That's a doctrine that's being taught today, that God's grace is greater. You know, there's other doctrines that you don't need the Old Testament, that the Old Testament is old, they cast that away, we only have the New Testament. So the, the, the key is this, be careful who you hang around with and what you're viewing on TV because ultimately it has the potential to lead us into, into error. And, uh, and this was a... You know, this guy was a false prophet. This is the guy that spoke to the donkey, remember? Anyway, we'll, we had enough donkey this morning. Uh, although, uh, Rita wants to give a testimony on that a little bit later, but we'll, we'll wait on that. Oh, yeah. You know, you know no telling what people uh, are involved with out there. <clears throat> Verse 15, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I what? He said, I, I, this, is, this is a tough one. I hate this one. And uh, laity comes from the division. Two words. It means clergy and laity. In other words, the clergy, clergy ruling over laity. Now, why does God hate that? Out of that city came a structure. It had to do with... Constantine, it had to do with the building, and eventually what they had is a priesthood and a laity. Right? Priesthood and laity. Now that is non biblical. Now I know there are some churches that have, you know, lay ministers and lay training and all of that. And they're trying to do something with the folks to get them more involved, but it's the concepts that are flawed. The concept, when Jesus came, he said, here's how it works. The Father says, I'm going to send Jesus. Jesus is going to die on the cross. He's going to go back to heaven. He's going to send the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is going to come in everybody and empower you to do the work of the ministry. Everybody gets a part of it. And this side, they said, no, 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 that's not how it works. It's the clergy who are the prominent, filled people, and we're going to give them titles like reverend. Reverend means to be feared and worshipped, by the way, and the Bible says there's none to be reverend except God alone. He said, you reverend, you're a doctor, the bishop, whatever it is, and you exalt that ministry, and then everybody under it is a layman. And you don't get to do much, a little bit here and there, and that's the flaw. Everybody's got the same power of the Holy Ghost to do mighty deeds for God. 
And the gifts of the Holy Spirit are miracles and works of faith and prophecy, words of knowledge, uh, word, uh, uh, words of wisdom. All of those gifts are resident in the Holy Spirit. God says, I hate this because it undermines my whole plan. It undermines, folks, the whole plan of God when you differentiate between clergy and laity. I tell people, please don't call me a clergy. Please do not call me the reverend anything. I just, Brother Ed and I pastor a church. That's my calling, but that's, that's about all I can tell you. And I try to do it well unto the Lord. But, but see, the structure said, God said, I hate this because this is going to, this is going to undermine the whole plan. The whole planet, everybody gets it. In the Old Testament, it was only the, prophet, the prophets and the priests got the, the Holy Ghost, right? The Holy Spirit would come upon them for a season. He said, no, New Testament, everybody gets all the power to do all of the work. But what happened is we got the cathedrals, we put them in rows, and they became spectators, and they, rather than being the church, they began to what? Go to church. And that was the flaw. And we're still fighting against that system today. Okay, let's finish her up here, all right? Verse 16. Here's the solution. What does he say? All right, repent. That, that, that's always the key. Now, there's two, there's two kind of repentance. One is the, when you get saved, you have to repent, turn away. This repentance is for a sin or a flaw, something that God is opposed to. But it, there's the, the two next words are the real problem. Repent what? Or, or, the, or else is to say, okay, well, if I don't repent, here comes the or else, and here's what he's going to I will come quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, I don't know how many churches are out there who read this kind of stuff and they still continue to do it. And they're fighting against not just the devil, they're fighting against the purposes of God, right? And because they have not repented of these errors. In verse 17 of the second chapter, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Not just to this church, but the church is. Everybody should get this. He said, now here's the problem. And we've got a whole lot of churches that they do not have ears to hear. They, they, they're, or they're not listening. I don't know which way you say that. But they, they're hearing something, but it's not going past their gray matter. You know, Hebrews 4, 1, it says, The things preached to them did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith. So you can hear this stuff all day long and say, ah, ha, huh, what's for lunch? And we forget the whole thing. We don't go anyplace. So we, we really need to take this to the Lord and say, Lord, is there something? We've got to repent here. Me personally? Us? We? Whatever. You know, what's going on with that? And, uh, and then he said to him, here, here's the benefits, here's the rewards. To him that overcometh, overcometh what? Overcome the laity thing. You know, overcome the fornication thing and the sacrifice to idols and every one of the churches has overcomers at the end so there's seven churches and you look at every one of those and you want to qualify because you get a whole lot of good rewards that come through it and he said here they are to him that giveth I will give him to eat of the hidden manna now hidden manna is simply this the manna from heaven is the word of God how often did they have to collect the manna everybody say every day that means you go to your Bible every day. And if you go to the Bible every day and you're seeking God, He will open up revelation to you. That's the treasure of God's Word. That's the hidden manna. Not everybody gets it. Not everybody sees it. Why? They're not after it. They're not hungry. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. What? With hidden manna. The revelation, the understanding, the insight, the wisdom of, of God's Word. That's what they'll get. Not everybody does it. A lot of people have a whole lot of interest in it. We watched, you know, last week about these guys that one last Sunday, about that fellow over there in, uh, in uh, Syria, wherever he was, and there were, he's looking for a page of the Bible. No, that was in North Korea. I'm sorry. North Korea, and he's in jail. He gets out there, and they're looking for a page, a page. A kid have no Bible. He's praying for one, one page. And when they find him with it, they, they torture him a little bit more. And we have Bibles every place, and we don't take time to read them. We have too many Bibles, because most of them aren't even Bibles. They're like something, but they're not Bibles. And, uh, I'll give him, and we'll give him a white stone, and in the stone, a new name. 
Now, some people said a couple of meetings for that. One is they also use a white stone to invite you to a, a, a feast. Like, if I'm going to have a feast, I'm going to invite you. And they didn't have, like, writing cards, you know, or, uh, you know, an invitation piece of paper. So they used to get stones. They used to write their name on it and drop it off to them. You were invited to the feast. How about that? And your name was on it. Also, when they someone was brought before the court and they want to find out was guilty or innocent, I don't know exactly how they did it, but they all got together, let's say there's six or twelve of them, and they voted, and they say he's innocent, well then they came with a stone, uh, one stone. If they was guilty, they came with another stone. If he was guilty, they came with a black stone. If he was innocent, it came with a white stone, all right? Now, I don't know if it was one stone or twelve and they put them in a box, doesn't matter. He said, but I'm going to give you, and on that is a, a, a name. Uh, a new name written. Now, a new name means a new nature, a new character. It's like Jacob, when he got, you know, when he got turned around, he went from Jacob to who? Israel. We went from Simon to Peter. We go so, so there's new names. There's a new name written down in glory. But, but, there's, but the name is the nature. It's the character of the person that's now been, been saved. And uh, so there, you, you get that. And, and the name is, the, the, the name ultimately is the nature of Christ. That's what you get. And uh, no man knoweth saving he that receiveth. He said, well, when you get it, you know, you know, you know the new nature that's in you. You, you. you now, you know you're a different person. You've been born again of the Spirit. You come, somebody, well, you're born again. I don't know. If it, well, you're not. If you don't know you're born again, that's like saying, asking me if I'm married. And I say, I don't, I don't know. I might be. My wife come up, slap me first, and then say... <laughs> Something kind, I'm sure, but if you don't know, you're saved. Say, we have pictures, you know, we do have pictures here. See, if you don't know you're, if you don't know you're married, you'd be looking someplace else, right? You're thinking you, if, if you were that dumb. Anyway, all right, that's, uh, that, dear ones, is Pergamos, also known as Pergamum. Be careful for, everybody say mixture, trying to get a pass saying, well, I don't really do the ministry because I don't, I don't have the, the credentials that the pastor has, so I really can't do anything. You just fell into a, the Nicolaitan spirit. Be careful. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, for this time that we've spent in your word, we give thanks, Lord. May the things that we've studied today, Lord, impact our lives, change us, alert us, lest we find ourselves on the wrong side of the spiritual equation. Lord, we are living in a time where there's tremendous, there's tremendous deception in the world. Tremendous deception. There's another gospel being preached. There's another Jesus. There's another spirit. But Lord, we want to be, through this study of these seven churches, we're going to be made more aware than ever before of the traps that the enemy might lay, of the potential failings that we might experience individually or as, as a church body. So we thank you for that time, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Continue to pray.